Say good morning. Jim, I can tell I'm getting older. That's louder every time I hear it. Good morning, good morning, good morning. Welcome to the day that the Lord has made. Amen, amen, amen. We have a few announcements today. Number one, let's keep um, Mom and Dad and Debbie and Bruce in your prayers. They've both um, got some cold now going on. Um, and Mom is officially going to have knee surgery on May 23rd. Um, so keep her in your prayers. Uh, I am going to need to see, I need to see everybody in the church council right after service to go over a couple things. Um, so stick around for a couple minutes. Uh, it'll be a grand total of three minutes total. And next Sunday, so Emmanuel United Methodist Church, my other church, they are sponsoring, a, not sponsoring, but they are having a trip to Sight and Sound Theater on September 20th. And next Sunday, we'll be opening up the, um, the reservation list in case somebody from Holy Cross wants to go. Um, just email me, or if you happen to be over at Emmanuel for whatever odd reason, put your name on the list. But uh, email me. Um, yes. Just waving at me. The kids in the background, for y'all that can't see them. Um, by the way, before we get to another announcement, um, keep waving. Keep waving. Um, Nate. Today or today is not Nate's birthday, but we celebrated his birthday yesterday. And his birthday was actually Tuesday. But if we could, let's sing happy birthday to Nate. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. And quick, everybody, it is Peach's birthday. She turned 94. Happy birthday to Peach. And now, for real, let's sing it to Gary. Gary, how old are you now? Well, he missed it last week. Eight, cool, 80. Happy birthday to Gary. Haven't you learned it's hard living in a selfie-centered world? We also have, um, so next week, um, I will be on vacation. I'm um, in fact, I will be on vacation starting Wednesday until Thursday the following week. So I will miss the next two Wednesdays. Um, so in my, in my place, um, I have found a victim to lead the service on Sunday next week. So thank you to Derek. And uh, so everybody come out and support Derek. And uh, it'll be live stream. Just remember, free electronic days. That always works for me. And any other news of joy or concern? Yes. Right after the service. Possibly. Possibly. But you need to wait that table that until right after the meeting. Okay, pause, table that till after the after the service. So anybody else? Yes. Who's going to replace me? Um, I happen to think that the church is filled with so many people. Um, I'm sure Rita and Carl will be glad to come out. Um, I, I'm sure that the, the rest of the church will they, they will come out and because there's nothing more enjoyable. So I've got to so I missed the I, I missed the Last Wednesday I was there, but I missed the previous Wednesday for being sick. Um, so when I showed up, and I showed up late, but I showed up, the, next, the first 20 minutes I was at after school was kid after kid after kid after kid for 20 minutes, running, crying, 
jumping on me, giving me hugs, telling me how much they love me and how much they missed me. So if you want a feel good day, show up for after school and then go play kickball with them. And that is always a positive. So Ron, uh, Ron will be here this Wednesday. I will pray for you, Ron. That could very well happen. <laughs> yes, Karen. For you and your family. Amen to that. Amen to that. Yes. Yes. So you're catching up quick. Ninety-three. Oh, fantastic! 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 Raylan. We will be glad to keep her and the family in our prayers. Thank you, sir. Anything else? If you could, please bow your heads. Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning with so much in our hearts and so much on our own lives. We've lifted up some names to you in our hearts, and we lifted up some by name. If you could, please help them to feel your presence, to feel your, your healing touch, to feel the peace and the joy that comes with a relationship with you. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen, amen, amen. If you could, please rise and join me in the call to worship. Even over the murmured hushes of the children in the back, can you hear it? Wisdom is crying out in the streets. That is a very good question because we are called to listen, to respond, and to obey. So come, let us worship the God of wisdom and of life. Amen. amen, amen. Please be seated. And I need all the kids to come forward. Gary, I need you too. Come on, Carter. We are the world. Oh, we are the church. We, we are the world. Kezia, come here. I need you front and center. Come here, please, young lady. Right here, right here, right here. Everybody, everybody, single lines, single lines, single lines. Nate, come here. Come here, Nate. Nothing. You didn't do anything, young man. You got right there so everybody can see that pretty face of yours. Rocky, do I need to bring you down forward? Come here, right over here. Right over here. Make sure Kezia stays, stays under control. 
pump. That's it. I am the church. You are the church. We are the church together. All around Jesus, all around the world. Please go have a seat. Thank you, guys. I know how it seems that all of these kids are so shy and quiet. So last Sunday, there were about 17 of us that went over to Emmanuel for the fellowship meal around 3 o'clock last Sunday. And uh, so the kids put on a performance, and they did a great job singing, We Are the Church, um, Jesus Loves Me, and I can't remember what else. They sang, but they also ran around and did a tour of the church. So uh, it is always a blessing to hear them sing. If you could, please join me in the bulletin for the prayer of the people. Please follow along with me. Loving and caring God, we come this morning seeking wisdom and guidance for our lives. Open us to your words of life and love and truth. May we proclaim with our tongues what we know in our hearts. In this time of worship, help us to more fully understand what it means to truly be a disciple, a follower of the way of Jesus, a follower of the path of wisdom, May the words of our mouths and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable to you, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Amen, amen. If you could, please, please rise and join me in singing hymn number 575, Onward, Christian Soldiers.
Amen, amen. Please be seated. Unless you are one of my ushers, because I need two people to ush, I need four. I don't need six ushers. So I'm going to disappoint four people. Um, Nate and Jordan, please come forward as we prepare our morning tithes and offerings. Back up, back up, back up. Thank you. Please rise. Thank you, thank you. Heavenly Father, God, we hear and we respond to your words of wisdom, your words of call and of life. May these gifts, not only of our money, but of our very selves, our words, our thoughts, our actions, be acceptable to you and help spread your words of life and of love. In Christ we pray as he taught his disciples to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us of our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Please be seated, unless you're the kids. Then we have a special treat today. We do. Yes, Raylan. So everybody have a seat and give him your undivided attention. So lead them in prayer. Lead them in prayer. Say, say a prayer to close out. Say a prayer to close out. Amen, amen. You coming to see me? So it's with a lot of joy that, that Raylan came to me last week, and he goes, Pastor, Pastor, I've got a message I've been working on. I've got a sermon. Can I say it and share it in church? And with fear in my heart, I go, how long is it? And he says, only two or three minutes. Oh, yeah, sure, then you can share it in church, no problem. 
And then he told me what it was about on Saturday, and, and I was like, it fits so well into what we're doing. But if you could, while we're seated, while we're seated, if you could, let's sing hymn number 723, Shall We Gather at the River? And I don't mean the parking lot. Please bow your heads. Wisdom cries in the streets, but we don't, we don't listen. We don't understand. The words of your law, Heavenly Father, they're spoken, but we rarely pay heed or obey. You call us to declare who Jesus is for us, but we can't seem to get the right words out. Our tongues engage before our brains do sometimes. We want so much to be a people who are faithful to your word and, and led by your guidance. But we are so easily distracted by the cacophony of words and sounds. Forgive us when we are quick to speak and slow to understand. Forgive us when we don't hear your wisdom in all the ways you speak to us. Forgive us when, when we don't even try to truly understand what it means to be your disciples. Lead us back to the path of wisdom and of life that we may truly live. Amen. Amen, amen, amen. So our scripture lesson today, it comes to us from the book of Mark. Mark 8, 34 through 37. If you've got your Bible with you, it is Mark 8, 34 through 37. If you don't, if you have your Bible app, it is still Mark 8, 34 through 37. So Mark 8, 34 through 37. I'll be reading from the message edition, the message translation. Calling the crowd to join his disciples, he said, Anyone who intends to come with me has to let me lead. You're not in the driver's seat. I am. Don't run from suffering. Embrace it. Follow me and I'll show you how self-help 
is no help at all. Sacrifice, self-sacrifice is the way, my way, to saving yourself, your true self. What good would it do to get everything you want and lose you, the real you? What could you ever trade your soul for? And this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thanks be to God. Amen. Amen. So it was last two weeks, somewhere around there, I was talking with some of the parents for one of the 8U softball or baseball teams. Quite frankly, I've gotten all of them confused. I don't know who's on what team or who's in what league. But I was talking with this 8U team, and there were four or five of us there. The, the parents and the adults were there. And this one little girl comes up, and she's the coach's daughter. And she asked her mom something, and her mom said, no, you're going to do this today. And who here can relate to when you ask your kids to do something, they give you that look, that utter disdain, distaste. And even Rocky's even pointing to himself that, that, that says, I don't want to do what you want me to do. How many times has it happened? And then the mother came back with that rapport, that, that, that comeback that all parents do, and said, don't give me that face. Don't give me that look. How many of us with our lives are giving God that look with our choices, our decisions, our emotions, our feelings, our wants, our desires? See, how many of us would rather have your will or God's will? What do you think you would rather have? What do you, what you want or what God wants? A lot of spiritual people are thinking in their heads, I really want what God wants. Do you really? What about when it's different from what you want? See, so many people believe that whenever we surrender our lives to Jesus, whenever we actually trust God, he's going to give us this happy and healthy and, and comfortable and trouble-free life. You see, but Jesus, he doesn't invite us to a life of comfort and a life of ease. And you might as well stop giving God that look that you've been giving him. Maybe you've heard it said, or maybe you've thought it yourself, being a Christian, it just makes sense. Your life will go better if you sign on with Jesus. But I say to you that if you actually listen to Jesus, if you actually take his teachings seriously, you're going to find your life gets a little bit more complex, a little bit more complicated. And as a matter of fact, let's look at another scripture real quick before we get into the meat of this. Let's turn to Matthew 5. Matthew 5, 21 through 37. Matthew 5, 21 through 37. We're going to hit some highlights. So Matthew 21 through 37. Now, this is what you call the red letter parts of the Bible. So what does it mean when it's the red letters? Jesus is saying it. So he's saying to these people, you're familiar with, maybe you've heard it before, maybe you've heard it said, the command to the ancients, do not murder. I'm telling you that anyone who is so much as angry with a brother or sister is guilty of murder. Carelessly call a brother idiot, and this one hits close to home for me, and you just might find yourself hauled into court. Thoughtlessly yell stupid at somebody, at a sister, and, and you're on the brink of, of hellfire. The simple moral fact is words can kill. This is how I want you to conduct yourself in these matters. If you enter your place of worship and you're about to make an offering, and you suddenly remember a grudge a friend has against you, just leave your, leave your offering there at the altar, abandon it, leave immediately, go to the friend and make things right, then and only then come back and work things out with God. Or say you're out on the street and an old enemy accosts you. Don't lose a minute. Make the first move. Make things right with him. After all, if you leave the first move to him, knowing his track record, knowing what's in his heart, you're likely to end up in court, maybe even jail. 
If that happens, you won't get out without a stiff fine. And you know the next commandment pretty well, too. Don't go to bed with somebody else's spouse. Hmm. But don't think you preserved your virtue simply by staying out of the bed. Your heart can be corrupted by lust even quicker than your body. Those given that look, you think nobody notices, they also corrupt. Let's not pretend this is easier than it really is. If you want to live a morally pure life, here's what you have to do. Here's what you have to do. You have to blind your right eye the moment you catch it in a lustful leer. Blind your, 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 right, ear, your right eye. You have chosen to live one-eyed or else be dumped on a moral trash pile. And you have to chop off your right hand the moment you notice it raised threateningly. Better a bloody stump than your entire being discarded for good in the dump. Then he talks about, you might have heard it said, and it's about divorce, and, and it's about other things, and it's about empty promises, and, and it's about loving your enemies. He's really come to task with this one. And you've heard it said. Jesus says to the people gathered around him, and this, this is, you know, at, at his sermon, he's preaching, and the gathered around him, listening to him, and, and listening to him teach him. And you've heard it said it's important to try to be compassionate and caring to those who are in need. And this is one of those red letter things, maybe, where Jesus said, sometimes you just got to be realistic, right? Cautious, on your toes. You know, someone might take advantage of your generosity. Okay, that's not really a lead, red letter. That's not really what Jesus said. But you've heard it said. You've thought it yourself. And I remember mom and dad were out of town. It's probably where mom caught her cold in the rain out of town. And they stopped at Walmart wherever they were. And they're going into the pharmacy to get something. And there's this lady that, that comes up in one of those motorized scooters and goes over to mom and says, I'm sorry, I hate to ask you this, but I can't afford to get my prescription. I know my head was going there too. My first thought was, it's a scam, mom. You didn't give her any money, did you? And she goes, well, no, she only said it was $2. And I said, you know, it's a scam, right, mom? My mom said that uh, she went up to the counter, and it was only a dollar. So she gave a dollar to, to the lady, said, here's for your prescription. Then the lady says, and you know there was a then the lady says part. Then the lady says, you know, I'm homeless. I'm hungry. I'm going, well, the lure was, was the dollar to see how easy of a mark you were going to be is what I'm thinking. I said, you didn't give her any money, did you? You didn't take her shopping, did you? And she goes, well, we didn't have time to take her shopping, so I gave her some money. And I said, really? And she goes, yes. I don't know if she was lying or not. It's not up to me. It's between her and God. What is up to me is to do the right thing. See, we want to follow Jesus' teachings, but a person needs to be realistic, right? But I say to you that Jesus appears to have very little interest in being realistic. The love and the compassion he talks about, they're over the top. They're irrational. They're radical. They're risk-taking. They're extravagant. They're passionate. His concern doesn't seem to be one iota about a person taking advantage of another person's generosity. He doesn't mention it. You've even heard it said, violence is wrong unless it's used in self-defense. You've heard people say, let's see them break into my house. Let's see if they're able to walk back out. I'm not sure Jesus said that exactly word for word. Okay, he didn't. But I say to you that Jesus appears to advocate something a little bit higher, something a little bit higher value even than self-defense. See, the problem with the average Christian is they get saved, and they kind of got one leg over here, and, and it's still in the world, and they got one leg over here, and it's, it's in the church. And it reminded me of there's this one basketball player a couple years ago from the church league 
and, and I'm not going to say what Paxton's name is because I don't want to embarrass Paxton, but Paxton was a great defender. And this was, a, this was a team where at that age you could not play defense out of the paint. You had to have your, your foot in the paint. So here's Paxton. He's got the tippy, tippy, tippy toenail of his big toe in the paint. The rest of his leg is stretched out as far as he could so he can, he can steal the ball and play defense. A lot of Christians, they try to do the same thing. They try to have that little tippy, tippy toe, that little toenail in church. The rest of their foot, the rest of their bodies in the world. And then they wonder why things don't work well for them. Well, it's, it's because they're what the Bible calls lukewarm. So lukewarm that he spits you out of his mouth. I mean, so lukewarm that, that you're following the world so much that it causes God to vomit. Picture that, if you will. See, so many ordinary, everyday folk like you and me, we look at what it means to actually follow Jesus, to emulate Jesus, to obey the demands of Jesus. And we say, surely he didn't mean that, did he? Pastor, you're just twisting words, aren't you? Did he? Are you? Is it just easier for us to pick and choose what seems the most reasonable, what seems the most doable, what seems the most comfortable, what seems the most according to what we want to do? And you've heard it said, People respond best to positive messages. And sermons that are affirming and supportive of them make them feel better. But I say to you that in this Sermon on the Mount that Jesus preached in our second scripture, Jesus appears to speak against some of our most widely affirmed practices, some of the things that we most commonly do. He, he seems intent to make us feel uncomfortable, maybe even a little angry. And you've heard it said, you've heard it said that the main thing you ought to ask and come to church is, what about me? What about my deepest needs? Are they going to be met? But I say to you, in this sermon, the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus doesn't care about your needs. As a matter of fact, if we take seriously what Jesus demands in this sermon, his words, there's a good chance that we will leave here today with more needs than what we had when we arrived. You might have heard it said, the purpose of a sermon is to help make religion um, rational to thinking people, to present Jesus in such a way that people will see that he is the answer to their questions and, and the solution to their problems. We got we to gotta cuddle. We got to... We got to make sure people feel special, but otherwise they're not going to believe Jesus. But I say to you that this, this Sunday, Jesus seems to want to create even more questions and instigate even more problems. See, we don't really have a problem with Jesus until we actually come to church and hear him preach. You may have heard it said, but I say to you, and if you all could see the face that you're giving to God right at this moment. See, here I am all excited about my vacation coming up and my, my, my week of rest. And, and this morning you're thinking, I think we need to rename the pastor, Pastor Downer. See, but we got some serious things to, to think about this morning. And then we got to go home and think about them some more. Because if we want to be followers of Jesus, we need to actually listen and obey all of his teachings. We need to do our best to live according to his teachings, not just agree with them. And that means listening to every single part of his teachings, not ignoring the tough ones and moving on. Now, I certainly believe that love, that love is at the heart of the gospel. It's at the heart of who Jesus is and what he teaches. But embracing that love and living it out every day means we need to keep our eyes open and to really see what we are doing. Because the way we live, the decisions we make, the way we respond to, to different situations aren't always as loving and kind as, and helpful as we might like to think. 
Because we see the world through our own eyes, through our own perceptions, the ones with, we've created from our own experiences. And we're really good at saying, but what about that person? It can be hard to step out of our own skins and to see others and to see the world through the eyes of Jesus. But as Christians, if we're going to call ourselves Christians, as Christians, through his eyes, it is, of course, through his eyes that we want to see. As Christians, we are supposed to learn from him, to respond to, to life in the way that he calls us to respond. But who is your teacher? Who's teaching you? Whose disciple are you? And honestly, one thing is sure. You're somebody's disciple. There are no exceptions to this rule for our human beings that we're just the kind of creatures that have to learn and keep learning from others on how to live. So we have to ask ourselves, who is our teacher? Who am I listening to? Who do I follow? Who is my mentor? Who do I want to be like? And we have so many options to choose from. There's Wall Street. There's Facebook. There's social media, there's TikTok, there's political leaders, there's authors, there's sports figures, there's fictional characters, there's actors, there's consumers, there's reports, there's alcohol, there's power, there's success, there's business, there's our past, our desires. But who is your teacher? See, in Jesus' day, the scribes, the Pharisees, they knew the law backward and forward. They were the self-appointed legal conscience of Israel. And they were bound and determined to make sure everybody obeyed the law to the letter. The law, of course, that was the Ten Commandments given to Moses, written down by God himself on tablets of stone and given to Moses on Mount Sinai. They were rules to live by. They were rules that made everything right. They, they were rules that were necessary to follow for God's will to be done. But for Jesus, yeah, the rules were important, but it was the principles behind the rules that were even more important. The point wasn't just about what was written down in stone, following exactly what was said by the letter. It was about God's intention for God's people to live in community, to have compassion for one another, to care about one another. It was about having the character and, and law of God written on the hearts of God's people. And that's why it says further on in the scriptures that we were reading that, that Jesus says, I'll tell you that unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. See, it isn't about following the letter of the law and being perfect. It's understanding that the law points to something bigger. It points to living as a community in God's, God's new world, a community that began in the coming of Jesus and that continues to be born through, through us and, and our world today. See, God did not make hell for man. That was for the devil and his angels. But he will allow you to choose to go there. See, Jesus takes the old law and wants us to hear the fullness of its meaning. And many people who heard Jesus preach that day and this day thought they were righteous and good until they heard Jesus speak about righteousness and goodness. But in his words, they and us, come to realize that Jesus expects his followers to be more. He set the bar higher. Higher than meeting the requirements of the law that we find easy and comfortable. You see, a tragedy, a tragedy has taken place. Man rebelled against God. You see, man has a will of his own and and God never meant that, that we would have suffering and hate and lust in this world. He never meant that we would have war and death. Look at the world this morning. Look at the communities around us this morning. Look at the families in this very community. 
There are difficulties. There's hate. There's prejudice. There's greed. There's lust. There's death. God never meant it to be that way. It was a paradise. But man rebelled against God, and that rebellion caused a wall to be built between God and man. And rebellion against God is called sin. Greed, pride, lust. Do you know that some people say we should, we should charge the needy when we help them? That instead of having a food giveaway, we'll charge them for the food we give away. Instead of having a clothing giveaway for those that are homeless or, or can't afford to buy their own clothes, we should charge them for the clothes that we, we give away. That we should charge people for doing God's will. Acting as if we're a social club or a thrift shop, not a church. See, we gossip. We tear people down. Are you actually supporting Jesus? Are you actually following Jesus? Are you actually a Christian? Or just following when you get what you want? See, we get angry, gossip, spread falsehood. We follow our own will and spread falsehoods. We, we follow our own will and ignore God's will. Well, those other churches, you know, the ones across town, they can be the ones that grow disciples for Jesus to transform the world. Pastor, you don't understand. We can't take the time. We don't have the ability to, to, to be more like Jesus. It's a disease. It's a disease, and, and the Bible says that all of us have sinned. Every one of us is infected with the disease of sin. It affected man's intellectual life. You see, your mind is affected by sin, and, there, and that's the reason when, when you come to the Bible, it's a closed book to you. Until you know Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit illuminates the Bible, the Bible says that we have a veil over our minds. We're, we're blinded by the God of this world, small g. See, sin affects our religious life, too. It affects our relationship with God. It separates us from God so, so that now we're spiritually dead. We might be alive and we might be smiling every once in a while, say hi to everybody, give everybody hugs, but physically alive, yeah, but our soul is dead toward God. And that's the reason why so many people don't find happiness don't find peace, don't find joy. We try to escape to this world and how this world operates. Sometimes we try to escape, but you cannot escape separated from God. See, everywhere we turn, everywhere we turn, there's another good cause requiring attention. And as Jesus followers, we're called to bring about change by, by loving all of our neighbors so well. But following Jesus isn't just another good cause to be a part of. It's a calling to give your lives to. Will it often involve an active part in advocating for other causes? Yeah, it will. Absolutely. But first and foremost, don't forget this part, we have to recognize that our mission is primarily to make disciples for Jesus for the transformation of the world. Without that as our primary focus, you will never find true happiness. Truly follow Jesus, and you're going to know that the God we know loves us, offers us grace, stands beside us as we learn lessons and, and seek to be more like Jesus. Our community surrounds us and strengthens us and is at its best when we all come together as one body of Christ thinking, acting, and becoming more like Jesus, knowing him not just as our Savior, but also as the Lord of our lives. So I wonder today, who is your teacher? Who do you listen to? Who do you follow? Who's your mentor? Who do you want to be like? Who's your teacher? And a few minutes... I'm going to ask everybody, if you have not, if you have not totally surrendered your life to Christ, come forward during this next song. We'll have an altar call.
come forward during this next song and pray and give your life to Christ. See, I read about this man that was trying to climb to heaven by a ladder that he had built. And he thought the way you did it was, was you put your good works here, and then your good works here on the next rung, and then another good works there, and then more good works there, and you're doing a good thing for Jesus here, and you're doing a good thing for Jesus there, and you climbed up and up and up, and you'd finally get to heaven. But he heard a voice that says, to climb up any other way is not going to work. The ladder fell, and he woke up out of his dream. And he said, if I go to heaven, I'm going to have to go a different way. Yeah, I'll have to go the way of the cross. And, and Jesus said, if, if you're not, Jesus said, if you're not willing to deny yourself and your, your, your heart and your wishes and your desires and take up the cross and follow him, you cannot be his disciple. Jesus said, if you cling to your life, if you try to control it, you always if you always try to be in charge, if you cling to your life, you're going to lose it. But if you will surrender your life, if you will give up your life for him, you will find it. In other words, in other words, surrender, that's not just a one-time decision. It's a daily choice. It's a daily choice to follow Jesus. To really follow him is to surrender control. So what are you trying to control? that God is asking you to surrender. For any who just think, well, I can just believe him as, as my Savior and not as Lord. It's not an option. Some of the passages in the Bible really scare me. For those who think that, that they're safe because they, they prayed a certain prayer, when the, New Testament, when the New Testament is about a decision to follow Jesus, to turn from our lives. That's what it means when it says to repent. That means I'm doing things my way. I'm going that way, my way, my choices. You're going to repent, so you're going to turn all the way around, and you're going that way. I'm following him now. So I wonder today, who is your teacher? Who are you letting teach you? Who are you listening to? Who do you follow? Who is your mentor? Who do you want to be like? Who's your teacher? And I invite you today, right here, right now, to surrender your life to Christ, to repent of your ways, to believe that he died for your sin, to know and trust him as both your Savior and the Lord of your life, to let him guide you and help you to do his will. So while we're singing this next song, hymn number 370, please rise, and if you feel so moved, Please come forward and, and pray at the altar and give your life. Surrender every bit of it to Christ.
Please remain standing and join me in singing our closing hymn that is in the bulletin, Bringing in the Sheaves. So this is a message that started back on January 1st, of all things, week 18. Week 18 of, of deciding how are, we, how are we responding to Christ? Are we responding like the wise men? Are we responding like, like Herod? Are we responding like Jerusalem? How are we responding with our lives with those, not just the big sins, but those necessary sins we think we have to have in order to live life? Because you might have heard it said. Or what about the necessary sin of consumer Christianity where our big concern is, what about me? And then there's actually deciding to respond to Jesus by trying to become more like him through extravagant generosity, through risk-taking missions and service, through the fruits of a healthy Christian. And when we think about how we respond to Christ. When we think about our desire for control, what we have to realize is that it's rooted in a lack of faith. It's rooted in a fear that God just doesn't know, that God just doesn't understand, that God is not always good. He's not going to do what I want him to do. He's not able to keep his promises. It's rooted in a lack of faith. See, when you overestimate your ability to control, you're always underestimating the power 
and the goodness of God. Think about it. You've heard it said by many people, I've got this. Let me be me. Well, what about, what about, Jesus, you're so good, I trust you, let it be. I know you've heard it said, you take charge, you be in control, you, you get it done. If I don't do it, nobody else will. But Jesus said the exact opposite. He said, if you give up your life for me, you're going to find it. To fully follow Jesus means to fully surrender control of your life. He's either Lord or you are. He's either king of your life or you are. There's no such thing as partial surrender. So the question to ask as you go forth this week is, who exactly are you following? Amen. God bless.